Hi there, my name is Ben and I like to read. Today we're going to be reviewing another inspiration, if you will, for George Orwell's 1984, which is Darkness at Noon by Arthur Kostler. So a little bit of background about the author. Uh, Arthur Kostler was a German writer. Uh, he was a very prominent member of the Communist Party of Germany in the late 20s, early 30s, was very involved in the party hierarchy, got to meet Stalin and all the big wigs, if you will, in uh, Soviet Russia. However, in 1938, in response to Stalin's great purges, he abruptly renounced his membership to the party and decided to flee what was then Nazi Germany and go to Paris. And he sort of bounced around after, uh, you know, throughout Europe during World War II, ended up in London, where he became a very staunch opponent of communism uh, and wrote, you know, a couple of books, most notably being Darkness at Noon, which he wrote in the uh, in the days of the Great Purge, but also he was uh, he was also the author of the uh, the Lost Tribe. I'm paraphrasing the title of the book, but essentially it's a theory that um, the Khazars in the uh, that were this historical tribe near the Black Sea were in fact the progenitors of. Uh, you know, Ashkenazi Jews, European Jews, so to speak. It was taken as historical fact. It's now been more or less debunked. Uh, it was quite controversial in its time, as was this book that we're reviewing. So a little bit about the author. Now let's move on to the actual book. So Darkness at Noon is a story about a man named Rubashov, who is a Communist Party official. He's been on missions throughout Europe to help to spread the word of the party. Uh, and then one day, abruptly, he is arrested. He's taken to a building and put into a room with no windows. He can't commu he doesn't communicate with anybody from the outside world, except for his interrogators, which he does face to face, and his cellmates, who he doesn't know their names, but through a tap code that they develop, they end up being able to communicate, and there's one gentleman by the name of Rip Van Winkle, and then there's another gentleman who he interacts with, uh, number 402, who was a Tsarist uh, officer of cavalry, if you will. And Rubashov is, you know, in his prison, he, this, guy, this guy's a man of principle. He's someone who's dedicated his whole entire life to the party ideal. He has... He reminisces throughout the book about the missions that he's taken, the essentially the course of his life, because he he knows now. Okay, I'm in this. I'm in this position. I'm going to. I'm going to be executed. But this book sort of explores his wrestling with his with the things that he's done. And there's multiple vignettes in the story in this book, I should say, um, where he actually where he describes let's say going to Belgium where he has to convince striking stock workers uh, sorry stock workers one take that's all we do uh, striking uh, dock workers I should say who are holding up an arms shipment that is bound for fascist Italy uh, in the name of communism of course Little do they know that this arms shipment was in fact sent by the Russians to the Italians as well by means of uh, getting some money. So Rubashov has to essentially liquidate, to put it mildly, all of them in order to make sure that the will of the party is done. Uh, there's another vignette where he uh, ends up betraying uh, the woman that he has a relationship with, and it's... All of it, it's fairly heart-wrenching, especially, and I mean, this is this is a work of fiction, but you can, I mean, what, is ha what happened in real life was probably ultimately even worse, because fiction does have a tendency to embellish. We, we have a tendency to, um, well, I shouldn't say fiction has a tendency to embellish, sometimes it does, but more often than not, actually, it cushions the blow of what actually happened in real life. Uh, just because the truth itself could seem 
not to sound corny, stranger than fiction. Ultimately, within this book, we get these two interrogators that Rubishov has to has to deal with. Uh, one of his old colleagues, Ivanov, who's very much a uh, he's a member of the old guard. He was there since the revolution was has started. He was a he wasn't necessarily a young man when the revolution started, but he was old enough to experience, you know, the travesty of the Tsarist um, regime in Russia. He saw the mass amounts of poverty, the massive amounts of, of debt that, that accrued, the cruelty that these, um, that, you know, the army and the Tsar and his cronies would do to the populace. So he understands both sides of the coin. He's, he's been there, you know, through multiple regimes. At the same time, however, so is Rubishov. Gletkin, on the other hand, the, se the second interrogator, is a younger man. He's only ever known, okay, this life under the party, this is how it goes. We have to, we must be brutal. We must be, you know, we must force Rubashov to confess by means of depriving him of food, depriving him of light, depriving him of sleep beating him. He's very, he's very much your traditional authority, if you will, uh, which is, of course, much easier to rebel against. If you have someone who is so vociferously going in and, you know, and, and essentially inflicting pain and suffering upon you, it's much easier to rebel against because you can say, okay, well, it's, it's clear now that this person is, you know, is inflicting this upon me all right, well, I don't have to, I don't have to listen to anything you say, you can just go and go on with your life and you'll feel vindicated in your rebellion. Ivanov, the older man, takes a different approach because he knows Rubashov. He served with him on the front lines, he served missions with him, he knows him intimately, and he knows that he's a man of principle and a man of intellect. His is much more insidious. He tells Gletkin, no, if we beat Rubashov, if we do, um, you know, if we deprive him of food, of sleep, if we torture him, he's a man of principle. He won't bend to that. But he's a man of intellect, and we're going to use it against him. So what we're going to do is we'll allow him food, we'll allow him his tobacco, we'll allow him even pens and paper, so that way he can write. And eventually, Rubashov, as a man of principle and as a man of intellect, is going to convince himself, almost in a very Socratic way, that he must confess in order to uh, in order to better the state, and we will have won without even having to lift a finger. Gletkin, of course, doesn't believe this, but acquiesces. He says, "Okay, Ivanov, we'll give you we'll give you a couple of days. If not, then we do it my way." And unfortunately, not to spoil the book for you, but Ivanov's way does work. It's, this book is essentially a, not just a thorough um, repudiation of, you know, 20th century communism and its evils, um, without getting too political. It's also a, a really harrowing and introspective book as well, because you can almost imagine that Rubashov is Kostler himself. He's using the character of Rubashov to, you know, come to the rational and logical conclusion as to, you know, if this system is so perfect and it's for the people, then why is this happening? Or even in Rubashov's case, let's say, if, you know, if I'm but one man, so if I'm a man of principle, then I have to stick to these principles all throughout, and my death will not be, yes, it's a small moment of pain for me, but ultimately it will further, it will bring about the utopia that I fought for my whole life. So in that sense, that's how, that's how Rubashov at the end ends up signing the confession and ends up getting executed. It's, it's very, very powerful. I have to say it's, I read this when I was in university. Um, it was probably, it, it was very, very impactful. Um, it, it's really one of these books that if you are interested in the history of that time, 
But also if you're interested in just, as Christopher Hitchens put it, actually in his book review for Slate, if you enjoy the battle of ideas for, the, for its own sake, it is definitely a book that you can't skip out on. It's, yeah, it, I mean, I, I can't really say more than that. I highly recommend that you, that you read it. Uh, don't skip out on it. Let me know what you think about it in the comments below, and I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for watching.